Hi, I'm Fire, and welcome back to the show where I yell about video games. Just kidding, that's my whole channel. At the end of the year, I have a tradition where I sit down and review every single game I played that year and tell you what I liked and disliked and what is and isn't worth your time. Last year, I joked about shortening this video just to my favorite and least favorite games from the year, but y'all really seem to like long form content from me, so I'll do the whole thing, just for you. So without further ado, let's get into the games that I played in 2023. I feel like everyone who plays games has been in this situation before. You come across a game that really isn't your thing at all, but then your friend finds it, gets really into it, and you end up getting dragged into playing it against your will. For hours and hours and hours. Well, that's the story of the very first game I played in 2023, V Rising. V Rising is an open world survival game where you traverse the world as a vampire lord on an eternal hunt for blood and resources to build a grand palace and grow your vampire powers. As much as I love vampires, <coughs> Team Edward for life, I don't really like open world survival games, so I wasn't interested in slogging through the forests and graveyards of V Rising to chop down the same trees and fight the same enemies endlessly. But Jack dragged me into it and I had fun, or at least some fun. The game is definitely everything I hate about open world survival games, long and slow and grindy, but playing with a friend who understands V Rising's many complex systems, it was easy for me to just tag along, hang out, and enjoy myself. Plus, the combat is actually fast-paced and fun, with a variety of weapons and powers to choose from which all feel equally viable. However, the grind can get a bit annoying, especially when the only way to upgrade your gear is to defeat a particularly bullshit boss which you feel you don't have good enough gear to defeat. But with patience and the power of friendship, it's worth your time. At least, until you inevitably burn out like we did. In my own time, I find myself drawn to a bunch of short indie titles, a trend which you'll notice continued throughout the year. The first indie title I finished, which really stuck with me, was Before Your Eyes. Before Your Eyes is a first-person narrative adventure game, which explores the life of a boy growing up one moment at a time. Beginning from early childhood and progressing through his adult life, the years pass in the blink of an eye. Literally. The game uses your computer camera to track your eye movement, and every time you blink in real life, you jump forward weeks and months at a time in-game. Some moments are clearly meant to be mere snapshots of long, quiet periods, while others are core memories which you and your protagonist will remember forever. But no matter how beautiful a moment is, you can never stay long, and at some point, you'll have no choice but to blink. As someone with very shitty staring skills, this game flashed by quickly, my eyes drying and dying by like the third scene. Even so, I was enthralled by the story it told, and honestly, sobbing like a baby at the end of it. It's a thoughtful, dark, hopeful, and bitter experience all at once, and for the emotional roller coaster it put me through, it's honestly hard to say if I recommend it or not. Truthfully, I think the game's main mechanic is fascinating, and it was perfectly explored through a captivating story but I also recommend exploring some of the game's content warnings before going into it, because I was unprepared and got hit out of left field with some stuff I sort of wish I was warned about. Deeply emotional, conflicting, but incredibly forward-thinking, Before Your Eyes is a standout indie among so many others. Moving on to another indie title, I gave Telling Lies a shot. Telling Lies is a narrative adventure game in which you watch out-of-order video clips saved on a hard drive and try to piece together the overall narrative explored in them. The videos follow David, our protagonist, a serial liar, and Tom Hardy look-alike, with many, many, many dark secrets. Having played other full-motion video games and enjoying her story especially, I went into this game with high expectations. Unfortunately, those expectations weren't entirely met. For a game all about its characters, I felt that everyone in Telling Lies was boring, with flat personalities and almost no real impact on the plot. While the underlying eco-terrorism and cheating scandals were somewhat interesting, they were buried under so much fluff that it was hard to ever get to or care much about them. By the time I unraveled the greater mystery, I was so over the game's characters and ideas that even the bigger reveals and betrayals didn't really mean much to me. Honestly, I think I had more fun playing this game on stream and making fun of characters with my chat than I ever would have playing solo. The bottom line with Telling Lies is that it's not as good as it could be, and it's far weaker than its FMV predecessors and successors. If you're interested in the premise, honestly, just play one of those instead. For my next game, I decided to finally switch it up. Haha, <laughs> I lied, it's another indie game! 
This time I played Little Inferno, a puzzle game in which you burn various objects in your family fireplace and watch their often explosive effects as they interact with one another. Along the way, you have to test different combinations and utilize your full catalog of items as you strive for completion and utter destruction. It's a very simple idea, but insanely satisfying as you burn more and more of your personal objects and satisfy your inner pyromania. I personally would have appreciated a bit more complexity in story, especially for a $15 game, but I still had fun with Little Inferno. I mean, my name is literally fire. What else could you expect? Actually breaking away from indie titles this time, I tried High on Life on a strong recommendation from a friend. And to my great surprise, I actually liked it. High on Life is a comedy FPS game starring local loser Justin Roiland, along with his well-known brand of irreverent sci-fi nonsense. However, despite its disreputable star and overdone premise, High on Life surprised me with its overall quality. Tight gameplay, colorful visual design, creative levels, and fun combat encounters turned what could have been a cringy experience into one I actually enjoyed and played through completion. Though almost every character talked way too much, about half the jokes actually did land, and I appreciated the light atmosphere to contrast the cosmic horror of alien slavery and drug trades. If you can get past the hit or miss humor and its shitty origins, it's an entertaining experience, just without Kenny. Fuck Kenny and fuck you, Justin Roiland. After my moment of weakness passed, I quickly returned to yet another indie gem, Speed Dating for Ghosts, a visual novel and dating simulator about meeting people in the afterlife. I hesitate to say this game contains romance, as most of the dates you go on are more about resolving each ghost's personal trauma and helping them figure out what they're going to do with the rest of eternity, rather than, you know, going steady. Still, it's a very fun and chill game, and I had a good time getting to know the wacky, haunting cast of characters, especially those older ghosts with more storied, often well-known pasts. There's not much else to this game beyond the characters, with simple backgrounds, subtle music, and no real meaningful decisions, you're mostly just buying this game for the writing. Thankfully, the character dialogue is compelling and easy to love. For $7, and sometimes as low as 70 cents on sale, it's definitely worth your money. If you play it, tell Spooky Peter I said hello. And I love him. And I miss him. <laughs> Still working through indies, I found myself playing Witchwood, a dark fantasy crafting adventure game. The game casts you, somewhat unsurprisingly, as a witch of the woods, who is tasked with capturing the souls of 12 animals who have wronged the townsfolk of a medieval society. As the witch, you must investigate the wrongdoers, gather materials, and craft creative punishments to their deeds. The game is admittedly a bit of a grind, and the majority of the gameplay involves running around from one zone to another, collecting the same materials over and over and over. Yet I was so pleased with this game's writing, I hardly noticed. Each soul mission is deeply satisfying to play through, involving a Grimm's Brothers fairy tale-esque punishment for each baddie. Playing through this game felt like reading a book of old fables, and as a lover of this exact kind of twisted fantasy story, I highly enjoyed it. As long as you could stand an endless to-do list of fetch quests, I'm sure you'll enjoy it too. While I was clearly finishing a lot of indie titles in the first few months of 2023, in the background I was actually working my way through a pretty hefty AAA game, one in a series I had long been waiting to try out. And that was Persona 3 Portable. See, Persona 3, 4, and 5 hit Xbox Game Pass in late January, and with 60 plus hours of playtime per game, I knew I had to get going on them immediately. So I cracked open Persona 3 as soon as I could, and I immediately fell in love. The game instantly hooked me with its 2000s art direction and voice actors, which brought me back to the long nights I spent watching anime in high school. Add to that the game's approachable turn-based combat, goofy characters, and Pokemon-esque collect-a-thon of personas to battle with, and you've got a recipe for a good time. Not to mention, this game's absolutely fucking bumping soundtrack. My god. I'd always heard the Persona games had amazing OSTs, but pretty much every time I encountered a new track in this game, I would literally stop what I was doing and just jam out for a few minutes, getting lost in the jazzy, upbeat flow. Unfortunately, the game does have its faults, with entirely too much grinding and a singular dungeon design that gets old in the first 30 floors out of 264. <laughs> Plus, the only way to get all the achievements is a second playthrough, which is literally just more of the same grind, again. While I can't see myself replaying any time in the next 10 years, I really enjoyed my playthrough, and I walked away from the game excited to see what its sequels had in store. 
By this point, it was March, and a lot of little games I had set my sights on started being taken off Xbox Game Pass. Although I wasn't able to play all of them, I did manage to sneak in a few before I lost access. One such game was Kraken Academy. Kraken Academy is an indie adventure game where you play as a new student at the titular Kraken Academy, a once prestigious school with four main houses, I mean clubs, music club, art club, sports club, and drama club. As you arrive, you discover a disaster will befall the school in three days, and you must use your powers of rewinding time to free the spirits of all four clubs and save the world or whatever. Though I wasn't really sure what to expect going into this game, I was pleasantly surprised by this game's campy writing, weird characters, and creativity in its various story events. In one time loop, you may be summoning a demon with a moon cult, the next you may be using the same cult's cauldron to bake a cake for your friend's birthday. It's a very cute and simple game, and even when things get crazy, and they truly do get crazy, it's always more amusing than it ever is irritating. Not to mention, this game has great sound design and does a beautiful job of balancing simple pixel graphics with hand-drawn portraits that breathe life into this little world. Kraken Academy is an unexpectedly fun game, and I highly recommend it to anyone interested. Plus, it's still better than Hogwarts Legacy, so... Next up, I played A Short Hike, a cute and casual little indie game about climbing a mountain at a wilderness park. If you've been in the cozy gaming community a while, you've probably at least heard of this game, famous as it is for its simple premise, relaxing aura, and big and chunky pixel graphics. Everything about this game is meant to encapsulate the feeling of a laid-back summer afternoon. Its warm colors, its cheerful music, its cute animal characters, and its small and safe little world to explore. Playing it reminded me of the feelings I got in the early days of Animal Crossing, and the excitement of exploring a new town and meeting new, unexpected characters. I even found a little spot in the short hike that reminded me of my favorite spot on New Horizons. Heh. <laughs> a short hike is the perfect game to play to unwind, and the true pinnacle of cozy titles. Honestly, I can't wait to play more games like it. Thankfully, I wouldn't have to wait long to do just that, as I continued my cozy indie gaming kick by playing Turnip Boy Commits Tax Evasion. Turnip Boy Commits Tax Evasion is a 2D adventure game in which you play a little turnip who has recently skipped on paying his property taxes, and as such you are tasked with completing a series of quests for your debtor, Mayor Onion. Along the way you solve puzzles, make friends, and defeat mutated baddies as you unravel the secrets of the government's corrupt schemes. It's a very cute, campy game with lots of internet humor, chill vibes, and a great soundtrack. Though it only takes about three hours to beat, it strikes a great balance between combat, puzzles, and collection-based gameplay, so nothing ever runs dry despite the general simplicity of the game. Much like a short hike, it's a perfect played on an afternoon type title, and exactly the type of game I was in the mood for while putting off filing my California state taxes. Don't worry though, I paid them. Probably. 10 out of 10 would procrastinate my taxes to play again. It was around late April at this point, and I came down with a nasty cold that had me homesick for a few days. Thankfully, the perfect medicine arrived on my PC on 420 of all days. And that was a steaming hot cup of Coffee Talk Episode 2, Hibiscus and Butterfly. Coffee Talk 2 is, unsurprisingly, a bartending type visual novel in which you serve coffee and talk to patrons in your late night coffee bar. Though there's a few of these types of games out there, what makes Coffee Talk special is its setting, a modern day Seattle inhabited by fantasy creatures, vampires, werewolves, banshees, and the like, living average lives. Despite its fantasy elements, it's a very grounded experience that's perfect for a relaxing few afternoons, and it's perfect for brainwashing you into drinking more caffeine than you probably should. As a sequel, Coffee Talk Episode 2 does great work adding fun characters, drink ingredients, and complexity in its ending and story paths that were a bitch to unravel, but a joy to explore. Obviously, start with the first game if you're interested, but for casual gamers and visual novel fans, this series is brilliant, and I'm so excited for more. Still kicking back and enjoying fresh indie titles throughout the spring, I took on Alba, a wildlife adventure, an open world game in which you explore the Mediterranean island of Pinar de Mel. There, you take photos of the local wildlife and get signatures to save the nature reserve before it's paved over and turned into a luxury resort. The game basically plays like Pokemon Snap, but with real creatures, as you photograph and scan animals to complete your Pokedex, I mean, Animalpedia. The game is definitely targeted towards a younger audience, as my chat took great pleasure in reminding me throughout my playthrough, but it's a lot of fun, okay? 
I had a great time exploring the island and its creatures, and I couldn't help but nerding out about all the birds and creatures of the islands. Truly a great exploration game for all ages. Despite what some people think, Alba A Wildlife Adventure is the perfect game for nature lovers, nerds, and everyone in between. Moving right along, I next played Umurangi Generation Special Edition, just as it was getting taken off Game Pass. Umurangi Generation is a casual indie photography game which follows a group of stylish young adults whose lives are uprooted by the arrival of hostile aliens. As the group's photographer, you follow your friends through the various urban areas in Taronga, New Zealand, as they prepare for the coming invasion. The game starts tonally lax, as your group hangs out, goes clubbing, and tries to ward off their impending sense of doom through fun photography missions. However, things escalate quickly, as violence and war leak into every aspect of their lives, until there's nothing left the group can do but accept humanity's inevitable defeat. Though its story was <coughs> quite dark, it made Umurangi Generation a joy to play, as I was able to experience both the coming violence and youthful hope that blossomed despite it through the lens of my camera. The photo challenges of the game, while sometimes annoying, also helped me align shots that I never would have thought to snap otherwise, and gave me a greater appreciation of the environmental storytelling of a game completely absent of dialogue. The game certainly had its faults, with somewhat buggy movement and time sequences that seemed to counteract the whole purpose of our role as a photographer. But I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would. And the photos I posted on Twitter got like 12 likes, so suck on that! <laughs> Hopping right into another indie game, I played Frog Detective The Entire Mystery, a collection of three adventure mystery games, The Haunted Island, The Case of the Invisible Wizard, and Corruption at Cowboy County. In all three games, you play as the titular frog detective, an upbeat and ever-optimistic protagonist who must interview subjects, partake in fetch quests, and make inferences to solve the case. All three games are very short and linear, made with bubbly character designs, vibrant colors, and silly dialogue sure to elicit a polite chuckle here and there. So basically, another kid's game. Now, the premise is definitely simple and somewhat childish. There's something charming about these games you can't deny, which made it a delight to play through. I'd love to play more from Developer Worm Club, and I know if they keep expanding, they can make some truly phenomenal stuff. At this point, it was right around the beginning of summer, and I was looking for some fresh content to keep me cool as the heat kicked in. So, continuing my journey through indie titles, I found myself traveling down Road 96, a first-person Choices Matter adventure game. The game follows several teens trying to escape the authoritarian nation of Petria, as they hitchhike across the nation to the titular Road 96. As you live their journeys, you make decisions which influence the political future of Petria, trying to keep your teen alive as they brave the often dangerous landscape and encounters on the road. What makes Road 96 so special is the randomness of these encounters, as each teen has a completely unique journey through the desert influenced by your choices. With one character, I rode with truckers through the vast deserts, mixing drinks and fighting off road pirates with a nail gun. With another character, I was kidnapped by a mysterious stranger at a motel, and had to choose my words carefully to get out alive. Though the game only really has a handful of named characters, there is such choice-determined variety in the ways you meet and interact with them that the journey to Road 96 feels fresh and new each time you undertake it. Even after beating the game, I had so many burning questions left about its characters that I played it again just to experience some of the scenes I'd missed out on the first time. I've heard Row 96 described as one of the best Choices Matter games out there, and from the variety in characters, gameplay, and narrative, I'm inclined to agree. Though I nearly skipped this game, I'm so, so glad I gave it the time, and I hope more people do as well. While I had played plenty of indie titles in 2023 up until this point, the start of the summer marked a truly massive indie completion for me. It was a difficult game that had been sitting on my backlog for years, a critically acclaimed masterpiece my friends had been begging me to try, and one of the kings of Metroidvanias and indie titles. That game, of course, was Hollow Knight. I made my first attempt at Hollow Knight back in 2021, while playing on my Xbox One. However, unbeknownst to me, my old Xbox had major input lag, which made an already difficult game feel nearly impossible to play. As a result, I put it down after about 8 hours, without much intention to return to it. However, I decided to give it another go this spring, and I beat the first boss I struggled with, Hornet, on my very first try. Well, damn. 
Hollow Knight was still a challenging game, and I went on from my early victories to die many, many times. But it was never unfair, and the journey along the way made every death feel worth it. Not to mention the beautiful environments, creepy cute enemy designs, and gorgeous soundtrack made the world a joy to explore. Plus, as hard as it was, I even grew to enjoy most of the combat, especially the boss fights. Though some of them drove me absolutely mad, they were all dynamic and fun to fight, and even more fun to beat. Hollow Knight certainly isn't a game for everyone, or for every system, but for those who enjoy platformers and are willing to put up with a bit of a challenge, I think Hollow Knight is an extremely rewarding and well-designed experience that blows every other game in the genre out of the water. Seriously, just play Hollow Knight. Going from the dark and difficult Hollow Knight to something much, much lighter, I next took on Trombone Champ, a comedy rhythm game about tooting along to various classical music pieces. With its over-the-top animations, jubilant characters, and many meme references, at a glance the game is little more than a colorful one-off joke. However, in truth, Trombone Champ is actually an extremely well-made rhythm game, with lots of secrets and collectibles to unlock as you play your way through its diverse library. While I initially only picked it up to play as a joke, as a rhythm game and collectathon enthusiast, I quickly fell in love with it, and actually ended up 100%ing it. It's a super fun and approachable game even for the most casual player, and not to mention funny as hell when you stumble your way through songs way out of your skill level. It's definitely worth a play, even if just long enough to get a good laugh out of it. It was at this point that my old friend Game Pass rolled back around with another urgent message that Omori was getting taken off the service in a few weeks. Though I hardly knew anything about the game, from the excited whisperings I heard from my friends and video essayists regarding the title, I knew it was going to be something special. So in an unusual move for me, I bought it on the spot at full price and played through it all summer. And it was phenomenal. Omori is a stylized turn-based RPG which follows a group of friends across two parallel worlds. In Headspace, you explore a dreamlike society with your childhood best friends, fighting monsters and goofing around as you search for your lost companion, Basil. In the real world of Faraway Town, that same friend group has been broken up due to a tragic incident years past, and it's up to you to reunite them and discover the truth about what happens that night. Besides this unique structure, the game also has stellar characters, beautiful art direction, banging music, and a phenomenal story, which masterfully explores themes of friendships, trauma, and loss. Though the turn-based story-driven RPG Maker narrative has been done literally a million times before, at every turn Amori managed to impress me, and it remains one of the more impressive indie titles I've ever played. Dark, nostalgic, and extremely well-polished, I can't recommend it enough. After months of sticking to indie titles, I finally decided to hop back on the AAA train and made my way through the Hitman World of Assassination trilogy. As one would expect from the title, the Hitman games are third-person stealth action games all about assassinating targets in unique ways. Though I'd already played the first game in the series, after two years I was ready to make my way back. Although this time, with a special condition. See, my friend Jack challenged me to play through the trilogy going for accident kills only, meaning instead of simply shooting my targets and being done with it, I had to use falling objects, drowning, electrical failures, and the like to do the deed. Overall, this challenge heightened my experience, as I had to get creative in setting up scenarios that would lead to my target's demise, and allow me to get away scot-free. The construction of the Hitman levels made this especially fun, as I found myself scaling skyscrapers, sneaking into Formula One races, and infiltrating secret societies to stalk and kill my prey. Even so, levels with the minimal environmental pieces and having to wait 5 to 10 minutes for targets to get into just the right position made some of the kills more of a chore than anything. Still, I generally had a good time with the trilogy, and appreciate as always the depth in Hitman's level designs and systems. If you've got the patience and are willing to play your own way, it's probably one of my highest recommendations from the stealth genre as a whole. After playing what was essentially three AAA titles bundled into one, I was immediately burned out of high-budget games again, so pivoted back to indies with A Little to the Left. A former GMTK Game Jam title, A Little to the Left is all about organizing items and spaces in satisfying ways, whether that be books on a shelf, sewing supplies in a drawer, or pressed flowers in a book. As organizing is one of my absolute favorite hobbies, I was extremely excited to play this game, and there was a lot to love once I got into it. With excellent sound design, cute visuals, and snappy controls, it was clear a lot of care was put into its construction. However, I found a few of the puzzles esoteric, 
or otherwise get frustrated with my method of organizing was deemed the wrong way. Still, I had a pretty good time with it, and I can see why every cozy gamer in the world fell in love with it. Though, in my opinion, assemble with care is still better. From chill and cozy to violent and bloody, I next moved on to action beat-em-up Midnight Fight Express. The game follows a former criminal lured back into a life of crime by a drone who is, maybe, his son? As they fight various factions throughout the city and attempt to restore peace before sunrise. This game initially caught my attention for its similarities to Hotline Miami and My Friend Pedro, two other action games all about bump and music and wanton violence. And as it turns out, the comparison was warranted. Midnight Fight Express is fast, sharp, and satisfying, with stellar combat and variations in level and enemy design. I most admire how many different things it was willing to try, as almost every level introduced a new enemy, environmental hazard, or weapon to play with. Yet at the same time, nothing overstayed its welcome, and the game's commitment to continuously changing things up always kept the game fresh, and prevented any would-be frustrations from lingering too long. For how good it is, I think more people need to be talking about Midnight Fight Express. So if you like the concept, and you like noise cream, I wish you a hearty go play it. Next up, I took a look at Tunic, a Zelda-inspired puzzle and exploration game about a little fox in a big world. As the fox, you'll collect fairies, keys, and manual pages, and slowly discover how to free your ancestor trapped inside the world's central chamber. Personally, while I enjoyed the overall experience of this game, Tunic was a bit of a mixed bag. Though I really enjoyed the combat and boss fights at first, they quickly grew tedious, as encounters with even the most basic enemies took way too long and used way too many resources. In fact, during the last quarter of the game, I even ended up turning on invincibility so I could focus on what I actually cared about, the game's puzzles. The entire world of Tunic is a puzzle, a complex maze looping back around on itself with hidden pathways behind every corner. Locked doors and hidden chests are everywhere, and by gathering the manual pages scattered across the world, you can begin to ever so slowly unravel this complex knot of secrets. While I'm not typically the biggest fan of puzzle games, I had a blast finding everything I could in Tunic, and ended up skipping the normal ending and jumping right to the true one by accident. Though its souls-like nature definitely means Tunic isn't a game for everyone, it's still a phenomenal puzzle game and a beautiful love letter to video games of old that I truly appreciated. Wanting to take it easy after Tunic's relative difficulty, I jumped into Venda, a cozy narrative cooking game about an Indian mother who immigrates to Canada with her family. There, she connects to her loved ones through food, and deciphers recipes from her mother's cookbook to teach her son about their culture. Though I expected this game to mostly center around cooking, its main focus was actually the immigrant parent experience and Venba's struggle to hold on to her culture. While Venba clearly loves her heritage and her homeland, her son Kavan rejects it, driving a wedge between them which we as the players must try to amend. It's a heartbreaking story especially as someone who has watched this exact situation play out between my dad and grandparents. Yet, told with such warm visuals and upbeat music as it is, the game feels so familiar and comfortable to play, like reading an old storybook. Plus, the cooking puzzles, especially as someone who doesn't know anything about cooking, were just the right test of knowledge and deductive reasoning. A short, wholesome title, Menba is a great comfort game, and absolutely worth an evening of play. After playing so many cutesy indie games in a row, I was craving something a bit more mature, and took on Immortality. Immortality is a full motion video game about collecting clips from three fictional movies, Ambrosio, Minsky, and Two of Everything, to discover the fate of the films and their stars. Although they first appear to be normal movies, scrubbing through certain clips soon reveals another layer, as a supernatural presence haunts Marissa Marcel, the star of the films. Unraveling the Spectre's intentions, and the consequences they have for the mortals surrounding it, is an intriguing undertaking. The fictional movies themselves are also phenomenal, extremely well constructed of narrative and mise-en-scene, so much so that I often found myself wishing they were real films I could experience from start to finish. Immortality's only problem was really its aforementioned maturity, as some scenes were so mature they caught me a suspension on Twitch. <laughs> Oops. Even so, Immortality is a great game with tons of great storytelling and absolutely worth a play for film buffs and puzzle lovers alike. Just, uh, don't stream it. Trust me. Retreating from Twitch for reasons I can't possibly imagine, I fell hard into Arcade Paradise, a management-slash-arcade sim. You begin the game as a kid working at his dad's laundromat, washing, drying, and returning clothes to customers for chump change. 
But once you realize the arcade machine you have in the back is making more money than the laundromat, you slowly begin to invest in more arcade machines until eventually you make your dream of an arcade paradise an arcade reality. Honestly, I tried to quit playing this game two separate times. The first was about two hours in, when I was getting anxious about trying to manage both the laundromat and arcade needs at the same time. Then I read a tip about only doing three loads of laundry a day and spending the rest of the time upgrading the arcade, which made balancing commitments a lot easier. My second near quit was about 30 hours in, when I had reached the end of the main story and rolled credits. Though I had every intention of moving on, I was having so much fun working towards the arcade machine goals that I ended up putting in another 20 hours on the same save. That's just how Arcade Paradise is. It's hard to put down. Every cabinet you add to your collection adds its own set of challenges that are difficult enough to require practice and patience, but more than attainable with time and effort. The gameplay loop is addicting as well, as the daily to-do list ensures you're always playing different cabinets every day while doing routine upkeep and goal checking on the side. It's wildly addicting, and this game thoroughly impressed me with just how much it sunk its teeth into me. As is the nature of arcades, I think this game has a little something for everyone, and I've gotten more than a few somethings out of it. My ultimate game of the year, and now one of the number one games I recommend to people, I highly urge anyone to give it a try. If not for me, do it for DBR. I mean, come on. Back on Twitch after my suspension, I decided to play it safe with No Straight Roads a 3D rhythm platformer about starting a rock band and fighting back against an EDM empire. I had first heard about No Straight Roads when it launched a couple years ago, and at the time, I was impressed by its colorful visuals and gorgeous soundtrack. So when I picked it up as part of a Humble Bundle in early summer, I was extremely excited to get my hands on it. Unfortunately, I didn't enjoy the gameplay experience as much as I would have hoped. Enemies attacking you on beat instead of you attacking them on beat, as is typically the case with rhythm-based action games, felt kind of backwards. Plus, some of the movement felt floaty and imprecise, one of the last things you want out of a platform. Of course, I still really enjoyed the visuals and the soundtrack that attracted me to the game in the first place, but the overall experience of playing it wasn't as much fun as I imagined it would be. At the end of the day, I think No Straight Roads is definitely much more of a watch instead of play kind of game. Though I'm absolutely re-addicted to the soundtrack now, I think I may have gotten more out of the game my first exposure than I did this time around. By this point, it was early fall, and I ended up catching a cold which kept me home from work for a few days. With nothing better to do than sit around and sneeze my brains out, I cracked open a fresh indie title in Beacon Pines, a cozy visual novel about a group of kids exploring the secrets of their small town. What starts with them chasing lights in the woods quickly spirals into unraveling a full-blown government cover-up, all centered around protagonist Luca and the mysterious disappearance of his parents. From its small mining town setting to its cute animal characters, this game has very strong Night in the Woods vibes, which drew me to it right away. Though Beacon Pines definitely has much lighter themes and tones than Night in the Woods, it still managed quite a few emotional moments and surprising twists in its storytelling that kept me engaged. Plus, its ability to explore branching story paths without making any of them feel repetitive or like dead ends was especially impressive. It's a short and sweet experience which manages to feel both familiar and fresh at the same time, and the perfect salve for a rainy day cold. Recovering from my cold, I was ready to end my months-long indie streak with a brand new AAA title the world had been waiting years to see, Bethesda's Starfield. After the underwhelming performance of Fallout 76, I was initially hesitant to fully embrace Starfield. Early environments looked drab and corporate, and promises of mostly empty planets and a heavy focus on crafting initially turned me away from the game completely. But when it officially launched in early September, my RPG-loving heart couldn't resist, and I started up a playthrough right away. And then I played for 100 hours. However, it turned out I was right to have some initial trepidation. As anticipated, I absolutely detested the crafting and resource gathering in Starfield, and early game limits on ship cargo made it so I couldn't engage with those systems fully, even when I tried. Planet exploration was also insanely boring, as every single planet had little to offer besides barren rocks and abandoned science facilities that took 10 real life minutes to walk between. And yet, the rest of the game kinda slapped. Though planet hopping was boring, exploring the game's main cities kept the heart of adventure alive for me, as I never knew exactly what was around every corner. The main story was fantastic, and the twists and turns in the third act genuinely surprised and impressed me. 
The faction and companion missions were also super well done, whether they had me fighting Terramorphs in New Atlantis or engaging in an epic space battle in the skies above Suvorov. Combat was easily the strongest in any Bethesda game I've played so far, and impressively was almost entirely glitch-free. Though I hated base building, shipbuilding was a blast, and I managed to make myself a lovely hot dog ship that saw me through the many skies of Starfield. As a space-based RPG, Starfield triumphed, and I fully enjoyed my time with it. As an open-world exploration crafting game, Starfield was watered down and utterly disappointing. It's truly a game where you have to find your own fun with it, and what's enjoyable to one person about the game will be boring and weird to someone else. While I enjoyed my time with it, I really only enjoyed, like, half of it, which is a weird thing to say and still have a positive impression of a game. But that's the reality of Starfield, and why everyone and their mother has such complicated opinions on it. If you're on the fence about it, I really just have to recommend you try it for yourself and see if it sticks. And if it doesn't, I don't blame you. Once again tired of AAA titles, I crawled my way back to the indie scene, where I picked up a relatively new title in Sticky Business. Sticky Business is a cozy simulation game in which you design your own stickers, print and pack orders, and listen to customer stories as you run your own small sticker business. It's an extremely casual and cute game, filled with adorable pixel graphics, calming music, and very colorful and wholesome vibes. I had a lot of fun messing around with our sticker creator, making tons of animal stickers, pride flags, and an entire Zodiac collection just because I could. The game gets a bit grindy and repetitive after a while, especially if you're going for a completion, but it's well worth a price tag for a few hours of wholesome fun to just mess around with. Sticking with cozy titles as I moved into late fall, I fell in love with Placid Plastic Duck Simulator. The game, well, if you could call it a game, is all about watching colorful plastic ducks float around a pool. And that's it. Every few minutes a new duck spawns, and occasionally you'll get a cool duck that has a unique twist to it, like a propeller hat that allows it to fly, or one that's holding a little knife. While exceedingly simple, as a huge collectathon nerd, I really enjoyed spawning in all the ducks and exploring their unique features. Plus, I was able to stream this game while doing some chatting and let my followers choose what duck they wanted to be, which was super fun. Though simple, this game is surprisingly wholesome to play with a community, and I definitely recommend it for streamers, or anyone else who just likes watching little ducks float around, which like, who doesn't? Entering winter in the final stretch of the year, I was gearing up for the holidays by tackling some cozy titles that had long been sitting on my gaming backlog. Due entirely to my desire to keep playing cute indies, and not at all because I was getting taken off Game Pass, I next tried Potion Craft Alchemist Simulator. The title really tells you everything you need to know about the game. You play as an alchemist who crafts potions and sells them to the local townspeople depending on their needs. Potion crafting itself involves sending your little tincture on a top-down exploration through a perilous map, where adding different ingredients determines what movements your potion can take. It sounds like a weird premise on paper, but it's pretty fun to explore the map and the funky little movements different ingredients can take you on. Well, at least at first. I actually didn't end up finishing Potion and Craft, as after a while I got tired of exploring the same map and making the same types of potions over and over and over. As much as I enjoyed the first five hours of the game, when I learned the next 20 hours would be exactly the same as what I had done so far, I decided it was best to quit while I still had a positive opinion of the game. Even so, I had fun messing around in Potion Craft, and I may eventually come back to it. Someday. On the hunt for more cozy titles to play this winter, I stumbled across Good Pizza, Great Pizza, a cooking simulator slash management game all about running a pizzeria. When I first heard about this game, I mistook it for that one pizza minigame in Club Penguin and immediately leaned into the hype and purchased it. And it was not bad, but not bad. In general, the game is exactly what it's advertised to be. A simple yet cute pizza making game all about satisfying your customers and making pies as fast as you can. In playing it, I was particularly impressed by the diversity in the game's NPCs. More than racial diversity, the game delivered people from all professions and walks of life, including unhoused people, deaf customers, uh, cultists, you name it, they made an appearance. The dialogue was great as well, full of reference humor or unique shorthand for different types of pizza that always kept me on my toes. The only problem with this game was, funnily enough, the same one I had with Potion Craft, its length. The game was designed to be as grindy as possible, with extremely tedious topping placement and a slow income system. And since this game started on mobile, it tries to sell you solutions to these issues, as well as cosmetics, through real-life purchases. Which was obviously disappointing. 
Overall, I enjoyed this game's core concept, but much like Potion Craft, I felt it could use some rebalancing to truly nail the landing. For now, it joins my slowly growing pile of retired sim games. In the final weeks of 2023, as the cold began to seep in and the year came to a close, I played Tiny Lands, a casual hidden object game about spotting the difference between two scenes. The game features a significant collection of beautifully rendered levels, each miniature 3D worlds filled with bits, baubles, people, and secrets. Though Spot the Difference is an exceptionally simple game and premise, the amount of care that went into Tiny Lands is apparent, from its gorgeous and often culturally inclined levels, to its soothing music, to its immersive sound design, to its tight and friendly controls. In a year spent playing indie games, I can't think of a more appropriate game to send off the year than an indie darling like Tiny Lands. And that's everything! Looking back, 2023 was a really great year for games for me. I was able to play so many breakout indie titles from developers I had never heard of before, and I really enjoyed pretty much most of them. <laughs> Obviously, in the real world, AAA titles dominated the scene, with stuff like Baldur's Gate 3, Alan Wake 2, Spider-Man 2, Tears of the Kingdom, etc, etc. While I'm only a little bit salty that I didn't quite have the money to play those games, there'll be plenty of time for these big games and more in the new year. So happy 2024 gamers, and I'll see you in a year to do this again. This is Fire, signing off for now. Bye gamers.